All right. Thanks all for joining. Uh, very good to see so many signups and so many of you here on an afternoon. So as Sahana mentioned, I'm Ganesh Chakravarti and I have been in the content space for over 14 years. I've been writing, editing, doing a whole bunch of stuff. I have uh, I have written thousands of press releases over my career. I have bylines in the media in a few places. And I've also uh, edited several nonfiction books as of now. So uh, the moment I realized that we could do a writing session of sorts, I thought that let it be a proper workshop format instead of just me talking about this. So we have a good 90 minutes and this will not be 90 minutes of lectures at all. This will be a combination of exercises, a combination of some bits of ideas that we can go over and some, uh, some things that you will always take away as good writing habits whenever you want to write any sort of thing. By the end of the session, uh, you all of you, if you do all the exercises, you will have a skeleton of an op-ed that you can finish maybe in a day or two. Right. So a lot of times beginning is one of the biggest issues, right? How do you even start? How do you even go about it? How do you even start thinking about the whole process? And how do you piece together the different components that make up an op-ed? And is there such a thing called a uh, components of an op-ed is also something that we'll tackle. One other thing is that all of you will have different, different writing styles, and that is perfectly okay. What we need to figure out is to get in touch with that indigenous, uh, indigenous writing style, right? Your own personal writing voice and see how it comes out when you do it in a op-ed format. That's basically what we'll do today. Cool. So like I said, we'll make use of the chat feature extensively. And we, uh, as we do the exercises, the, you can post your answers over there. If you have any questions in the middle, you can post your questions over there. And I saw a lot of the questions. A lot of those will be covered as we go through the slides today. Cool. So we'll begin. Right. Firstly, I wanted to talk about this, right? B-L-U-F and blind. Bluff and blind. These are two very good editing principles that you can always utilize, right? So the reason why I'm using editing principles right in the beginning instead of at the end is when you're thinking about things, when you're thinking about ideas, putting together a lot of different ideas together, disparate threads of information together, knowing what is most important, knowing what the bottom line is, is very, very important. Right? And if you have a very good handle on that, it becomes much easier for you to write your pieces, uh, structure the whole paragraphs in a different way, and uh, maintain things like flow and singular voice and unity and all of those things. I'll just explain some concepts about what I just said. Right, A lot of times, whenever, uh, especially in the realm of public policy, social sector, and all of these areas, whenever you're working across an op-ed, whenever you're working on an op-ed, you're naturally working on different strands of thoughts, different ideas. Some of those ideas will be in different stages of completion, right? You will not know whether you have reached the logical conclusion or not. In such cases, knowing what you're thinking about, knowing what exactly is the conclusion you want to get, that conclusion is your bottom line. And if you're able to start with the bottom line, it becomes much easier. So the bottom line up front is very simple, right? You have your conclusions in place, you have your ideas in place, and you pick the most important point and you lead with that point, right? That is the bottom line up front. This is something that was popularized by the military, the American military, wherein they used to write... Um, Whenever there used to be memos, now it is emails. Whenever they used to send in the subject line, they used to tell you what exactly needs to be done, right? And that would be things like action, read, report. So you know exactly what you need to do the moment you read the article, the moment you read the email, the moment you open that memo. So that is the idea behind bottom line up front. A little bit of advanced version of that is the blind thing, right? And that is more useful for us in the social sector, for instance, because not all of us are concerned with singular actions. Everything that we do encompasses a period of time, 
So you have a bottom line. What is the impact on the organization? If it is not an organization, what is the impact on the focus group that you're thinking about? What are the next steps to be taken and what are the different details that are associated with that? Right, and you folks can mute yourselves, please. Thank you, <laughs> right? So yeah, these are two very important things that you can think about. I'd just like to show you a couple of examples of what this is when you actually look at it in real life. Okay, this is lovely thing that I do, and sometimes people find it weird, but actually, as in when the session is too long, it becomes much easier. I make people read things out loud in my session. So I'm calling a bit of volunteer, any volunteer who can read the passage on the screen out loud. Should I pick on the one who has accidentally unmuted themselves? I can do it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a study at a high school writing center and found that students who received praise or positive feedback on their writing said that the feedback made them want to work harder. Students who received negative feedback, on the other hand, felt angry with themselves for a lack of writing skills. This shows that praise is more productive than negative feedback. Thank you. So this is a question to the rest of the people in the session. What do you think is the most important takeaway in this passage? your answers in the chat and i am going to mute that one person who has unmuted themselves the last line okay that's pretty good does everyone concur praise is more productive than negative feedback last line right so now you're getting the idea bottom line if you lead with the bottom line it looks something like this Right. Research has shown that praise is more productive than negative feedback. And then the rest of the stuff will naturally flow. So this is the idea behind the bottom line up front. Now, what you can do to see this in action is to go and open any major publication in the world. Right. Not just in the world, even in India. Most of them follow this kind of format. The first sentence of a paragraph. Right. And this is also what people call a topic sentence. So the topic sentence is a sentence which prefaces what the rest of the paragraph is about. It tells you what the whole paragraph is about. It tells you what the whole idea of that passage is going to be. Right. That is the idea behind a topic sentence. Now, this is a lovely editing principle that you can take into account. So the reason why I started up front is that. Once you have the skeleton today, after we go through the different slides and the different uh, concepts that we cover, if you apply this particular format, this bottom line upfront format to all the paragraphs that you have written and eventually to the entire op-ed, you'll have a very good format to go with, right? That's the idea behind this. Any questions here? No, okay. Right, now we get to the meat of today's session, right? So it's about framing an op-ed. How do you think about things when you're writing an op-ed, right? How do you look at things when you're writing an op-ed? This is a lovely quote by Susan Norlin, a writer I follow a lot. She's also a New York Times journalist herself. And her idea is this. When you're researching your learning, when you're writing your teaching, that is the most important bit. Whenever we read about stuff, right, we always think that, oh, the idea is very clear in our heads. So if I write about it, it will be just as clear to the person who's reading it. That is almost never the case, right? That is never the case. How clear an idea is in your head is maybe 10% translatable to the rest of the people that are reading it. That's generally how I see it. That's generally how editors see it, right? It's not possible for people to come up to speed to your level of understanding just by reading your thoughts. That is why when you're writing your teaching, as writers, it is the onus is yours. The imperative is yours. The onus is always on you to ensure that the reader can catch up to what you're trying to say, right? That is the whole 
point behind writing an op-ed itself. So writing an op-ed does many things, right? First, it informs, it explains, it does a lot of things, but most importantly, it calls people to do a certain action. And sometimes that action could just be taking the reader to think along the lines that you're thinking, right? To make them think along the lines that you're thinking. And that is also a call to action itself. So in order to do that, they need to be up to speed. And which is why adopting a teaching approach to an op-ed makes it much easier, right? So this is the first step. Somebody unmuted. This is the first step in order to writing an op-ed. Whenever you're writing, you're teaching. Remember this. Maybe if you want, you can write it down somewhere as notes and then. Yeah. Right. Here are some more bits about framing an op-ed. You'll have lots of notes, right? And the notes that eventually make it into your op-ed are the ones that analyze the information within. So when I say information, every op-ed will have some sort of a conclusion, declaration, or something that you're trying to say. Anything that makes more sense of that automatically goes into an op-ed. That is why I call them notes. Right? They help you understand the problem better, frame solutions better, and do uh, the translation bit a lot easier. The second bit is that it is building stories around truth. So when I say building stories around truth, truth is usually absolute, right? The interpretation of truth keeps changing, but truths are absolute. They are usually axiomatic in nature. We take them to be true. The idea behind Oped is to build a story around it. Why a story? Because those are the most easiest way in which you can relate to people. You can understand different things. Without stories, we are nowhere. Everything that we write affects somebody, right? Especially in the social sector, it affects a lot of people. Any individual who's being affected by what you're suggesting, any special groups that are being affected by what you're suggesting, there are deep stories within all of that. And it is useful if you're able to use those to build a good story around the truth that you're trying to impart. Right. Next, the writers should know much more than the content that they are writing. This is very, very important. And a lot of times a lot of people do Google search and read 10 different articles and think that, oh, I know enough about this to write an op-ed. That is usually not enough. That is not to say that such op-eds don't get published. They do get published all the time. There's nothing to it. But in principle, writers should know a lot more than the content that they're writing. Because my personal benchmark is whenever I have to write an op-ed, I would have read a couple of books around that subject. Before that, I don't attempt writing an op-ed itself. It is very rare that I've seen a lot of good writers attempt writing op-eds just by Google search and putting together, piecing together different pieces of information. That's, you can make out those things and those are usually weak. And the impact of that, right? the ability to convince people, the ability to tell people a good story diminishes the more you do that. So always know a lot more than what you're writing. The next point is tied to several of the questions that came to me, right? How do I know that I'm ready to write about something? Right? How do I know that I can start writing about something? So this is one way of answering that. And I say one way because that is a never ending curve, right? You will never be certain about whether you know enough to write about this or not. And that is, that's a difficult thing to do. But a good marker to yourselves to understand whether you're ready is if you're asking the same questions again and again, after reading different material, right? So this is because sometimes the industry that you're working in has plateaued. Sometimes the issues that you're working with have hit a roadblock, not just for you, but for all the other organizations that are working in this space, right? So if you're coming across same questions again and again, if you if 
the entire ecosystem is grappling with the same problem again and again, and you know enough about it, then you are ready to become a writer. If you have researched 100 different papers and several books and all of that, and if still some questions are unanswered, that's a good way to understand that you're ready to become a writer, right? So this is a good marker for you to keep in mind. If you're asking the same questions again and again, then you're definitely ready to become a writer. Okay. Next, I want to talk about this. How do you start, right? How do you start an op-ed? What exactly is your entry point to an op-ed? A lot of times people assume that the moment they're reading some news, it is very easy to use that and to write an op-ed itself, which is true. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a very real difference between what a news is and what an opinion is. And news versus opinion makes the most important distinction wherein you can start to write an op-ed. Uh, another volunteer to read this out loud, please. I could do it. Yep. BBMP plans new flyover above Hebbal to ease connectivity. This is the third big ticket flyover proposed this year by the civic body, including the ones already existing to connect the area with the proposed Terminal 2 of the airport and the Central Business District. Thank you. So what you have right now in front of you is a piece of news, right? There's no bias over here. There's no sort of good or bad. There's no value judgment over here. About... It's just a reportage of an event. Something is happening. Somebody has planned something. Somebody is doing something. If you were to draw opinions from this piece of information, right? I'll repeat, if you were to draw opinions from this piece of information, what would some of them look like? Your answers in the chat. Why a third flyover? Okay, yeah, it makes sense, right? The question is simple. There's a passage on the screen and it's a piece of news. If you were to draw opinions from this piece of news, what would they look like? The answers are a good indicator, right? Flyover won't ease traffic. They're not planning well enough. They're building too many flyovers. Civic body is being proactive. Flyover is a good solution to use connectivity or it makes things worse. Okay, you're playing both sides. Civic body is working hard towards building better infrastructure. What happened to the existing ones? More roads. Why not? Okay, I'll look for some more answers. There are 47 people in the room. No proper maintenance of the old one. Environmental loss might be flouted, more disruptions, and what will one more actually do? Okay. Do we need a flyover to or an overhaul to the entire system? <laughs> what is ease of connectivity? Good. So if you look at the kind of answers that have come in, right, that's a very good example of how different opinions are shaped, right? Everyone has a different opinion. Now, the idea is you draw an opinion and then you test the opinion to the different evidences that are there. If you're able to find evidence that corroborates the opinions that you have drawn, then you have the start to an op-ed, right? Now, I we did mention that you could think about topics that are relevant to your specific focus areas. If you have thought of those, you could start writing about that particular uh, opinion, right? Whatever you have drawn. If you have any that are specific to your focus areas that you want an op-ed, you want to write an op-ed about, 
this is how you start. What is the opinion that you're drawing and based on which information? If you are able to do that, you are starting to write an op-ed, right? Now look at, look at the different strands that emerged. There's one about civic society, there's one about urban governance, there's one about public finance where people are using different funds, there is infrastructure, there is airport, there is potholes which talks about political economy, there are a bunch of different things. So everything is deeply interconnected and everything, even though they are deeply interconnected, can be disparate disciplines on their own. So that is the idea that you need to keep in mind. Draw opinions. Test those opinions against your uh, against the evidences out there. If you find evidence that corroborates your opinions, you have a start to your op-ed. So for the purposes of this session, I will assume that all the answers over there have evidence, okay? Because we're just doing a mock session of sorts, workshop of sorts. For the purposes of this session, let us assume that all the opinions that you have drawn have uh, evidences that corroborate. Okay, we'll do one more example of that. Can somebody else read this out loud? Uh, yes. Yes, Sony, go ahead. So, under the COVID vaccination drive, the Government of India is using Rapid Assessment System, RAS, a platform developed by Ministry of uh, Electronics and IT, uh, Amy ITY, for taking feedback from those who get vaccinated. This initi initiative to utilize RAS platform is aimed at improving the vaccination experience for citizens while ensuring that all norms are being followed during the vaccination process at all vaccination centers. Thank you. Thank you so much. The main reason I make people read things out loud is that when you read it, you form a different story in your mind. When it is read out loud, you form a different story in your mind. <laughs> So that's why I do that. Same exercise. Can you just uh, draw opinions out of this? Why so many different platforms? Is the RAS inclusive? Introducing new tech amidst to pandemic. Uh, try to do more like how you did for the first one, right? Instead of saying phrases, uh, write full sentences like you did for the first one. The moment I said same exercise, people are like, oh, I can shorten this right now. Oh my God. Okay, latest tech. Why introduce another? Okay, feedback is central to process improvement. It's very good. All these techniques don't make sense. It is too late. <laughs> okay, very conclusive that is. <laughs> Wouldn't go in be sufficient? Only feedback. What about implementation? How rigorous is the collection process? In fact, it is a platform, the best way to seek it. Who is it excluding? Wait for a few more answers. Should Meti be the one making the platform? Okay. Great, right? So I hope all of you got the drift. Right. This is just how, uh, this is generally how you draw opinions from news. This is again just a piece of news and you can draw different opinions out of it, test it out against the evidence that is out there and then you can start.
right? So this is how you start writing about, thinking about an op-ed. If you don't have an idea, if you do, if you haven't thought very closely about what you want to write about, if you read a lot of news, if you read a lot of books, research papers, whatever it is you do, right? Can you derive opinions out of it? Sometimes I find that television is a very difficult medium to draw opinions from because most news television has already become highly opinionated, right? I usually find uh, news more from PIB and things like that because over there they just give you something that is so stripped off style and other things that it just makes it easier to uh, do the analysis and do the thoughts around that. So you can find different sources, but if you don't know how to start, where to start, this is a very good way to start. You get a piece of information and then you sort of uh, derive opinions out of it. Cool. Please ignore my message, copied the wrong bit. Okay. PIB is Press Information Bureau, yeah. Okay, now we come to the framework of writing op-eds. This is a lovely framework to use if you have never written an op-ed before, right? I told you in the beginning that there are some components that go into every op-ed and it is these components that make an op-ed a good op-ed, right? So that is, these are some of the components that go into writing an op-ed. First things first, uh, whenever you're writing an op-ed for say the print media, say Deccan Herald or the Hindu or any such places, you, you usually have a stringent word limit. The word limit doesn't exceed 600, 650, depending on the typeset and the kind of, uh, depending on the page on which it appears, right? You have a hard, uh, hard stop at 600. You can only write 600 words and submit it to them. Digital publications, it's a bit higher, but an ideal length I would consider is 800 words, right? Don't go beyond 800 words because people will generally lose interest. There are longer op-eds, definitely there are. Sometimes special uh, assignments and special op-eds, guest op-eds or by request, Sometimes they go as high as 1,500 and all of that, but then those are very, very long and they are very, very rare. If you read even things like Mint and all of that, they stick to 800, 850. So ensure that these are the two things that you need to keep in mind. If you're submitting to a print publication, keep it below 600. If you're publishing to a digital publication, keep it below 800, 850. That should be your ideal uh, thing. Within this word count, you need to have all of these different components, right? You need to have a headline, you need to have a lead and a thesis, you need to have a description of the problems and your solutions, you need to have counter views, and then you have to refute or reiterate, and then you have to reiterate your position and then draw your conclusions, right? So these are the components that make for a very good op-ed. The reason I've given it in this particular order is not to not to say that you need to write your op-ed exactly in this particular format, but except for the lead and thesis. But other than that, these are all components that go into your respective op-eds and you need to ensure that you have a lot of these things. First, what is a lead and a thesis, right? And thesis, it, do not think of thesis as a PhD thesis kind of thing, right? This is a very different thesis statement of sorts. Headline is quite self-explanatory. It will be the headline. Then you have what is called the lead and the thesis. There are many different ways of looking at lead and thesis. And some people say that, oh, lead is something that... Uh, that hooks the reader onto the rest of the article and then uh, makes sure that they follow along. All those are good and nothing wrong with those. But a lead is something that usually sets out your position about a particular issue. 
right? It is something that sets out your position about a particular issue. And the thesis is that one line summary of your entire article that people can just take away just by looking at your introduction itself. Why is this important, right? One is it's, it's good. It's good hygiene, nothing more than that. And the other bit is that you are sort of respecting the reader as to the time that they're spending reading your article, right? They know exactly what they are going to get if they read the entire article just by reading the introduction. So that is the reason why you need to leave in the thesis. Then you have a description of the problems and your solutions. Right, what exactly is your solution? And I say arguments and evidence and all of those things will also come into place. Then you have counter views, right? Wherein this can be popular counter views as to what people are saying. Well, you are saying something, there's a popular counter view to it, and you could either incorporate it and you can refute it. Then you reiterate and prove your position with supporting details. You draw your conclusions and provide the solutions. So this is the framework to write op-eds, right? If you have never written op-eds before, this is a good way of thinking about it. This is a good way to ensure that all of the different components are automatically included. We'll go into detail into each one of these now. So I just wanted to showcase this particular framework. Any questions on just this right now or the things that we have spoken about so far? I'll do a countdown of five, four, three. Okay, <laughs> there's one by Swami. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, my question is I'm not very clear about what is the difference between lead and thesis. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I was not very clear about the explanation. It seems like both of them are same. So they're... They're the same in that they uh, they flow together, right? They're not essentially the same, but they just flow together. Uh, when we look at the examples, it becomes clearer to you. So they flow very well together. That's the whole idea of what it is. Lead, like I said, is your position and the thesis is some, the one-line summary of your article. That's the takeaway for now. We look at examples and... I think it will become very clear for all of you. Any other questions? The description will contain the argument and evidence. Hmm. So that is something that uh, simple, right? As in, once you have set out all the things, you have set out a lead, you have set out a thesis, you have to describe what exactly it is, right? And how you arrived at the solution that you arrived at. Uh, it's it's also this is where you go into details of how to how you arrived at the solutions that you came to, right? So that is where you take the reader along the rest of your story. If, for instance, if your lead in thesis is saying something along the lines of uh, India should do something about its foreign policy, right? The description of the problems and the solution would be something like. Look at all the things that are happening and how uh, international relations in different places are in different stages and what India should do in order to come to a good, good uh, standing in all of these things. That would be one way of looking at it. If you were to look at something uh, more deeper, something more local, right? You would say something like, there's a lot of uh, traffic congestion in this area. Perhaps ensuring that making some areas one way, making some area or putting a circle in some places, putting a signal in some places is going to help. And when you move into the description of the problems, you go into the technical details. Where is it happening? How much time is it taking? And what are some of the most important areas that are getting affected by it? And what are the different kinds of people that are getting affected by it? If you were to talk about traffic, you would say something like introduce more public transport, right? And when you go into the description, you would go things like go into things like how many people use public transport now versus how many more can use 
if there was a better availability right this is how you go into details and description and all of that so is that clear yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you. okay great any others Okay, so we move to the next one for now. Okay, so here is an example of a lead and a thesis. Right, here is an example of a lead and a thesis. It usually covers where, when, and what. That's most important point. Where, when, and what. Ah, uh, another person to read this out loud, please. I'll read it. Uh, lead, yeah. setting the stage. When, uh, sorry, where, when, and what? News hook. On May 29th, Starbucks will close 8,000 locations to administer racial bias training for its employees. The move is a response to a national to national outrage over the arrests of two black patrons while they were simply waiting for a meeting to begin at a Philadelphia coffee shop but is training enough to address the epidemic of discrimination by companies, New York Times. Thank you. So uh, this is a question to the rest of the people in the session as well, right? What are different things that you can spot in this simple passage? Where, when, and what? Very smart. <laughs> okay. Racism, HR management. Okay. What mind if? Okay. So that is the implication. Context has been established before the opinion is made. That is wonderful, right? Is the training nationwide not specified? Focus on the answer that Raymond, Raymond said. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Raymond Ramo. Right. The context has been established before the opinion is made. This is something that is very, very important. Most of the time, whenever you're uh, whenever you're writing any sort of op-ed, and especially more so in the social sector, right? There are different events that happen, different bills that get passed, different protests that happen, uh, different legislations come into force. A lot of times, something current is uh, going to help ignite that interest once again, right? That is why news hook, this is an example of what is called a news hook. The problem of racial discrimination, unfortunately, is a very old problem, right? It has been there for a very, very long time. And many, it has caused many wars, conflicts, and most unspeakable things in history. But an event has happened once again, which reignites this kind of thing, right? So you bring, you tie your issue to a current happening, and then you ask the question once again, right? That's basically the idea behind a new soap. So this is the most common form of use, writing a lead and a thesis. So what is the thesis asking for over here? What is the key question that this op-ed is asking for? That uh, is training enough to address the... Correct. Right? Is training the solution? Is training enough? Is it something that is going to solve the problem forever? Right? So this is a very good example of a lead and a thesis statement. For instance, the moment you read this particular bit, this is the first paragraph, right? The moment you read this as the first paragraph, you know exactly what you're going to get in the rest of the article. You know exactly what you're going to get, what kind of answers will be, uh, what kind of questions will be answered, what kind of insights you will gain, and what happened to those two individuals who were asked to move, right? So there is... This is a very, very good example of how you can structure your respective op-eds. 
Now, the exercise over here is for you to think about your focus areas, think about your topics, think about what is it that you are most passionate about and what you want to write an op-ed about. Is there a question between the op-ed that you're writing? Is there something that you're asking of someone in the op-ed that you're writing? Is there a declaration that you're making in the op-ed that you're writing? Right? These are the things that, this, this is something we covered just in the beginning, right? What exactly are you trying to say? Are you trying to question? Are you trying to declare? Are you trying to say something? All of these things. Can you tie that particular statement, right? The question or the declaration or anything that you want to say to something current that is happening? And can you share some of those answers with me in the chat? in your respective focus areas. I realize that not everyone might have read and it is perfectly okay. This isn't a homework. This is in school. So if you can share something that even comes off the top of your mind, that is also okay. Could I read it? Of course I can read it. So what I said about the news hook, right? About can you tie it to something in your own respective focus areas and come up with a short lead and a thesis like this? And can you post your answers in the chat? Wow, this is a wonderful answer by Anindita. We work with media accountability, okay? And digital news is now getting its own self regulatory bodies, but how efficient are self-governing bodies for ensuring media accountability? That's fantastic, right? I mean, you have a perfect uh, news hook right there about talking about media accountability, talking about different regulatory bodies. As Raymond mentioned, setting the context before asking the right question. This is how you do it. Very well done, thanks. Uh, I'll wait for some more answers. I love this kind of cuisine things because it keeps people thinking. There are 47 people and I only have one answer. Oh my goodness. What if I call people out who have turned on their videos? That's okay. Trying to frame is good. Faster, please. All right. There's another one. So the Jeevan mission is collecting under, okay. The data is being entered into a program MIS and will be locked out. What will it take to make village level data reusable across programs? That's fantastic, right? There's a very key question that comes to your mind. What will it take to make village level data reusable across programs. Communicating the uniqueness of impact model is something we've struggled with some puppets. Okay. Yeah, that's a statement. Specialization and geos in geospatial science. Okay. Knowing the lack of observation, can we leverage remote sensing data for public policy? Right? Good. That's a good one. Oh, the only thing that I can think of additionally is. Uh, Knowing the lack of data, uh, observation data blocking is in your head, right? I don't know what the <laughs> data blockage is. So if you could just start with 
something like there's a huge lack of observation data or something and then can we leverage this right that is the only improvement that i can think of but you got the gist of it right so well done gender and violence according to ncrp data there's been an increase in rate of violence da, 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 da. but are helplines enough cause for most uh, are helplines enough because most of the women were stuck at home right so you can end that with are helplines enough to solve this particular problem most of the women were stuck at home will go into the description and arguments right to repair okay can you hear about the maintenance plan the time for right to repair has well and truly arrived under months facing problems is the island capable of bearing more people very good okay will the program succeed when similar programs in the past have failed to deliver results having spent thousands of crores right yeah in this case you can say the government has announced one more program you can just say what program that is so great great answers thanks everyone this is uh, great participation right so this is exactly how you start writing an op-ed right now you have a lead and a thesis for your respective op-eds you have the lead which is you are establishing some th problem that exists you have a thesis statement which is basically the key question that your article is trying to answer right it could be helplines it could be uh, success or failure of a program it could be protection against uh, data breaches and all of that right so this is exactly how you write leads and thesis well done let's look at another example of a lead and a thesis this one is more of a lead but not thesis. can another person read this out loud please i can do it yeah go ahead bob hall was a rancher in 1936 in the midst of depression he was suffering from cancer that was eating a side of his flesh on his face his ranch had dwindled to nothing and weeks later bankers took the last of his livestock hall died leaving his family deeply in debt buzz newton hall's neighbor said i always thought so much of your dad he was the most generous man i have known newton told hall's son yes i'll co-sign the loan note david Brooks. thank you this is another example of what we call a story lead right so this is where you introduce a big problem this is a problem about debts. This is a problem about the Great Depression and all of that. This is something where you, yeah, it is journalism jargon, exactly, right? So this is something where you use a story of an important stakeholder and then highlight a particular issue. So depending on where you are, right, depending on which industry that you're working in, you'll find a lot of stakeholders that are directly affected. Now, when we looked at the news hook and all the different answers, right? And the same people don't have to answer again. I'm just saying, when we looked at all the different answers, you were able to find out your focus areas. You were able to ask very meaningful meta questions in place, right? So in this case, can this is an example of a story. Can you think of any good stories in your respective focus areas? wherein you could uh, you could think of right you don't have to answer this now that's okay but this is another way of looking at it right can you think of a story of an individual or a group of people or an occurrence an event right something that happened maybe a natural disaster that happened that brought a lot of community together to fight it in ways that you had not expected Right? These are all wonderful stories that you need to pick up. These are all lovely things that you can find out in your respective focus areas. If you're looking at data protection, there are lots of frauds happening, right? <laughs> so that is also a 
good story to introduce from the perspective of somebody who was defrauded. Right? These are another. This is another way of looking at a lead. The final bit is this, right? You can also use wit to highlight your respective points. Like this example, Peter Thiel, Facebook investor and Trump supporter, who is by all means a terrible person. He did, however, come up with one main analogy about modern technology, disappointments of modern technology. We wanted flying cars. Instead, we got 140 characters. Okay, but it is 280 now, but who's counting? Right? This is another example about the trappings of modern technology. David Brooks is... Uh, uh, journalist with The Guardian, and his writings are another that I totally follow. I think you too can. This is wit, right? This you can use whenever you are writing about something light, or if you want to make light of a very serious situation, this is also something you can use. My suggestion, uh, if you have never written before, it is safer to go with news hooks because it is fresh in everyone's minds, even the people that are reading about it. And that is something that can help you get to the point much easier and also help people relate to that particular point in a much easier way. That would be my suggestion. Yes, Jacob, you have a question. Hi, Ganesh. Just, uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, so the opening of the line is designed to be a preview when like someone reposts the thing like because the previews of articles show up on a Facebook or a Twitter or a, uh, or a LinkedIn uh, and therefore he's made sure that the first sentence alone is praise and cursing <laughs> so, <laughs> so my question is wouldn't this sort of bring on some sort of bias like, words, like no defamation uh, like it it opens the writer up to def public defamation. Well, yeah, all the time. Uh, provocation is one of the biggest uh, modes of gaining attention, unfortunately, nowadays. So that has become a very standard practice. So what you have mentioned is a very good observation, and that is there. And it is now considered valid practice. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. So sorry for disappointing, but that's unfortunately become standard practice. Doesn't mean that we should always actively engage in it because it, as a matter of principle, as somebody passionate about our own focus areas, if we don't want to engage in it, I actually discourage people from doing that because I find it is easier when you don't have to shock people every time. That's the whole idea. You don't have to provoke an emotional reaction in all of that. Unfortunately, a lot, if you go on Twitter, Twitter is a provocative space, right? And a lot of provocation happens over there. But uh, if you look at just, the funny thing is if you read news by uh, when shared by someone in Twitter, you have a slightly different opinion of it than when you just go to a digital publication and read the piece of opinion over there. This is what I've observed. So perhaps if you want to avoid that, you could also have that particular practice in place. Lovely. Good question. Thank you. All right. Now that we have the lead and a thesis, I want to focus on what is an argument, right? Basically, an argument is bought by supporting evidence and uh, evidence-based argument. And it sets out the necessary ingredients for an op-ed. But now I want to throw this question to everybody in this session. What exactly is an argument? And I love this part when I look at the kind of answers that I get. What exactly is an argument? Your answers in the chat. Let's see who gets it right. Quickly, quickly. The point quickly. we are trying to make. Point we are trying to make, okay. A conflict. Supporting para for thesis. Proving the fact. Okay. Let's. Your voice, a non-obvious opinion, presenting both sides and supporting a side, your opinion substantiated by evidence, appeal to someone, 
using a set of premises influencing others' point of view, evidence, agreeing to disagree. Okay. No, no, no to all. It is all of the things that you're mentioning, but uh, it's not exactly what an argument is. What do you want people to agree with? Oh, necessarily. Why our position is what it is. Uh -huh. Okay. Point of view backed with facts. Is it? Presenting your bias in the best possible manner. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's far away from what an argument is. An inquiry, supporting the opinion, reasoning. You're all circling around the answer, but not coming to the answer. It's like a maze of uh, Minotaur's labyrinth. Only in the center, there's no Minotaur. There's just a meal. Yeah. Difference of opinion between two sides about common experience. <laughs> That's a very, very long way of saying what you want to say, but it's okay. I'll take it. But that's still not the correct answer. What exactly is an argument? Establishing a point of view. Okay. No. Argument does that, but what is it? A difference of opinion. Representing facts. An assertion combined with some evidence to support why your assertion is correct is almost close to the answer, but just there, right? He is uh, he's knocking on the door, but is not opening it. Yeah. Truth, belief. Logic behind the fact. The point ideas that you used to want someone to point of view. I am guessing nobody is going to get it right today. And the moment I say it, you'll be like, no, that's not the right answer. But I'm willing to see that disappointment in all of you. That's all right. Point ideas that you used to want someone to be persuaded upon. There are 47 people in this room and not one person is giving the right answer. Oh my God, provoking a response. Non-productive clash of opinions. Okay. I think you should give it now, Ganesh. <laughs> Okay. And our stupidity. <laughs> right. Well, an argument is a statement. An argument is a statement. It is just a statement. It is nothing more than all of that. It is a statement that does all the things that you mentioned in the chat box, right? An argument is a statement that does all the things that you mentioned in the chat box. But an, uh, an argument is just a statement. What matters about an argument is its validity, right? And there are many things that give a statement validity. And some of you answered that correctly, right? Whether it is backed by evidence, whether it is logical, whether it is reasoned, right? All of those things. These are the things that give an argument validity, right? So an argument, an argument is just a statement. It is a valid statement. How do we ensure this validity? We look at some examples. I'm going to use some very dummy examples first to drive home the concept. And then we look at very real published examples wherein it makes sense. Okay. A valid argument is a deductive statement, right? That provides decisive logical support. An invalid argument is a non-deductive argument, non-deductive statement that fails in providing conclusive support. Role reversal occurs when evidence points otherwise. So this is a wonderful thing that I example that I use all the all the time. Uh, in the early 1900s, there was this popular statement that was there all over the place. It said that motor cars are the solution to pollution. I'll repeat, motor cars are the solution to pollution. Why? Exactly. Good. Viraj got the answer right. 
and Vivek also got the answer right. The pollution was of a different kind. And role reversal has happened now after 100, after about 100 years, right? Now motor cars are not the solution for pollution. <laughs> yeah, because it rhymes is not <laughs> correct answer. But this is how role reversal occurs. Over a long enough period of time, something that was evidenced may not necessarily be true because horse manure, horse dung used to was a public health hazard. It was a different kind of pollution that caused problems. Now you have a different kind of pollution that causes problems. So that is when role reversal occurs. Right? That is an example of role reversal occurs. Anyway, now deductive and non-deductive. Here is an example of a deductive statement. Patrick's genes are blue, therefore Patrick's genes are colored. This is a deductive statement because blue is a color, as simple as that. If you look at the next one, if you throw a dice, either it lands on a six or it doesn't. So there is a 50% chance of it landing on six. Why is it non-deductive? Dice has many sides, very simple. So it is not, it can't be 50%. The chance is much higher, correct. So let's look at some real world examples of what a deductive and a non-deductive statement looks like. Correct, conclusion does not follow. Right. India's big expenditure plans are laudable, but resources must be used prudently, efficiently. Our interest payments exceed productive spending, which often falls short of its target. This must change. Debt burden is worthwhile only if it works well for our economy. We should diversify funding resources, improve tax administration, and set up a fiscal council to guide governments. This is, an, is this a deductive statement generally? As in, does, can you reason the things out one next to the other you can right you because it starts with the big expenditure plans it says that it must be a certain way right our interest payments exceed a certain way this is all setting the stage this must change it must be a certain way and then it goes on to all the other uh, conclusions so this is an example of a deductive statement Right, in the sense that they flow, there is reasoning behind it, there is a perfect logic behind what they're trying to say, even though a lot of it is just a uh, lot of it is just how something should be a normative statement, so to speak. Right, there is a perfect flow and uh, rhythm to the whole thing, so that makes it a deductive, uh, deductive argument. Let's look at a non deductive argument. For all their pleasure, vacations can be taxing in COVID times. Yeah, Filling government forms online can bring on anxiety attacks at the prospect of a series of illogical questions. Returning home to the familiar captivity of COVID can be such a relief that it's easy to slip into a mutant form of Stockholm syndrome, happy to be around stuff that offers us comfort. Why is this a non-deductive statement? It's very similar to the dice. Because dicing. it's witty. Huh? Because it's not straight, it's witty. Okay. True, that is true. And it's very similar to the dice example, right? What is true for the writer is not true for all. As simple as that. What is true for the writer is not true for all. It is generalizing a set of decisions taken and it is saying that that is how things are and it is easy for people to just be at home rather than go out. Who knows, some people may be okay with all the form filling and because they find that the captivity is not something that they would rather be with and it is okay for them to put up with that kind of paperwork just to get yeah as Manisha said it is not relatable for everyone what is true for the writer is not true for everyone else so that 
opinion is not deductible to all. Now, the other thing that I want to focus on is that I got this also from an article invent, which means even non-deductive opinions can be published, right? They also get published. It doesn't mean that non-deductive opinions don't get published. But non-deductive opinions, it's very easy to refute them. It's very easy to ensure that uh, those can be just uh, argued against. So that is something that you need to keep in mind. So this is what an argument is, right? An argument is generally something that is deductible, flows very clear. Right. So good arguments have three building blocks, right? That is something that, and you would have read this in your college or in other places as well. Fundamental building blocks of a good argument. There are three fundamental building blocks. Ethos, pathos, and logos, right? But if you were to translate it to modern thing and not the literal English translation, it would be more like ethics, logic, and emotion. These are the three fundamental building blocks of a good argument, right? Ethos, pathos, and logos. So this is something that is very, very useful for people to understand, right? These three different things always make, uh, make up for the bulk of your arguments. Logic, logos would be things like data, numbers, graphs, previous performances, and all of that. Emotion is what appeals to an individual, right? Ethics are normative stances, how things should be, how things are, and how things should be, right? These are, these are, this is the way you need to think about it, ethos, pathos, and logos. It is possible that you may not have all three of them in every argument that you compose, right? If you're arguing for something in uh, about measurements and how things are supposed to be measured and all, your thing mostly falls in the realm of ethics and logic and very little in emotion. But if you're arguing for uh, support, if you're arguing for donations, if you're arguing for more work to be done in a certain way and for public opinion to, if you're looking to sway public opinion to a specific cause, you use more emotional arguments in place, right? So that is, these are the fundamental building blocks of a good argument. If we go back to these examples that I showed about arguments, right? In this, there is a thing about fear. In this, there is a thing about comfort. In this, there is a thing about... So fear, comfort are familiar emotions that you might bank into. Whereas the logic of it is a little less because it is logical only to the writer. Right, the logos aspect in this is missing, and that is what makes it kind of uh, non-deductive as well. In this example, if you see, it is a lot about uh, logos, and it is a lot about ethos. There's a lot of ethics. There's a lot of logic. Logic are in the first bit of it, right? Big expenditure plans and how they are. The ethos is how things must be. Right, it is a lot of that. There's almost no pathos in this, which can sometimes be useful. Right, so these are the fundamental building blocks of a good argument. If you're able to take care of those, if you're able to find out different methods, if you're able to find out the different things that are there in your respective op eds and in your respective write ups that you're doing right now you'll have a very good understanding of how to do that. Next, what is a counter view? A counter view is a statement that echoes popular sentiment. It is an argument that counters your ideas with evidence, and sometimes it is personal bias that needs addressing. Right? This is basically what counter views are. Do not think of counter view as something that is out there to get you, right? Out there to deeply oppose what you want to say. It's not that at all. It is these things. Let's look at some examples.
this is the first example is a wonderful example where religious remains stagnant slash stable over a period of time i have included the forward slash to say either or you read the statement as villages remain stagnant over a period of time or villages remain stable over a period of time those can remain those both of those are valid counter arguments right if you say that villages don't develop a lot the counter argument for that is but they remain stable over a period of time right if you say that economic activity in villages uh, needs to pick up the counter argument for that is no because right now villages remain stagnant over a period of time so these kind of counter arguments are things that you just incorporate right you just you don't you can't refute this particular argument it is something that you acknowledge yes that even exists this is a famous counter argument and you just uh you just take it take them into account that's basically how you do it can you repeat please yes i can repeat <laughs> right the first example is a counter argument that is mostly true to whatever you want to say if you want to talk about development stagnation naturally becomes a counter argument if you want to talk about uh, slow growth stability becomes a natural counter argument right that's basically how uh, villages so in such cases you acknowledge that the counter argument exists and yet it is not a hindrance towards what you're trying to say right you just acknowledge that but if you look at the second one right that is a kind of thing that you just refute right it says the western political establishment had to replace the evil of the soviet union with another threat perception to keep people in fear hence dawned climate change anybody who says that today would be considered a i don't know what they would be considered <laughs> but this was said in the 90s by a author i really admire unfortunately but in such cases you refute the argument because there's no logic to it and the third one right third one is a philosophical argument right if we see the opposition as the smart stuff stun off planet we might lose control and this is a philosophical argument right in this case again you acknowledge you incorporate so you can do two things with arguments you can acknowledge incorporate or you can refute by acknowledging and incorporating what you're doing is you're signaling to the reader that you have thought about things in opposite ways as well this uh Aristotle's art of rhetoric says that if you are able to rephrase an argument your opponent's argument in a way that they agree then you have won half the battle right that's what he says in the art of the rhetoric so this counter view incorporation is an attempt to do that i understand that sometimes it might not be possible given the word count and the given the kind of uh, like mostly word count really and <laughs> most of the time sometimes it may not happen but in such cases it's okay to let go but if you do it if you're able to do it 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 will give your opponent a lot more credibility that's basically what it does then you have the conclusion right a good conclusion and i get this a lot how do i end an article i don't end i don't know how to end an article i have written so much but i have no idea how to end it right that's something that i get a lot you can end an argument with these things you restate your argument the things that you have done right the statement that actually sets out the most important bit offer a solution right as in this is the problem i have offered a solution in terms of argument i am going to repeat that solution at the end calls people to action it is time for people to think a certain way the time of this idea has come the time of this particular method has come right these are all conclusions that call people to action if you have used a story hook then you wrap up your story right what is the conclusion for instance we saw bob hall's story what happened to bob hall's son 
who had his neighbor help him. That would be the conclusion to that story, right? That is basically how you write conclusions. This is another bit about conclusion in that you, if you started on a specific note, right? You can end it on a general note. If you started on a general note, you can end it on a specific note, right? <laughs> there is something that you can also keep in mind. Usually when you write news hooks, it's usually, it's better if you go from general to specific. That's basically how uh, this whole thing comes. So that's the bit about writing an op-ed. Cool. I'll quickly revise before we go into questions. So how do you write an op-ed? You have to think about op-eds a certain way, right? And uh, draw opinions out of different sources of news that you get. That's basically how you start writing an op-ed. An op-ed has several key components, lead and a thesis. How do you write a lead? You present with the most important information up front. You identify the most important uh, thesis question and ask or declare whatever that is, right? That is basically how you write a lead and a thesis. A lead and a thesis basically sets out the whole premise of the rest of the op-ed and gives way to good arguments. What is a good argument? A good argument is a statement that is deductible and provides logical conclusive support. And it helps you uh, clarify, understand, describe the problems and issue different issues and all of those things, right? That's what an argument does. Good arguments have ethos, pathos, and logos, right? And ethics, logic, and emotion. Depending on the kind of action that you want your op-ed to perform, if you're if you want your op-ed to make people think a certain way, you need more of logos and ethos. If you want to sway people to a certain opinion, you need more of pathos. You need more of emotions. It's okay to not have all of them, but these are the fundamental building blocks of a good argument. Then you have counter views. Counter views are things that are actively there. It can just be a public opinion or it can just be something that is out there for everybody to see. Acknowledge ones that are evidence-based because that is all you can do. Refute the ones that are just declarations that people are making without any evidence. These are two things that you can do with your counter views, right? And counter views, you may not always have the particular space to do that given the word count. And then you can do the conclusion, right? Uh, conclusion is basically something that wraps up your story, offers a solution, calls people to action, right? This is basically how you write an op-ed. And finally, to reiterate, uh, print media, if you're submitting to them, you can uh, keep the word count as 600 to 650. If you're submitting to a digital publication, you can keep it around 800 to 850. Last bit about that I really wanted to talk about and uh, also a very important question, how do you pitch to different publications, right? So there are many ways you can do that, but before all of this, I want to give a disclaimer uh, in the sense that there's no secret ingredient, there's no secret sauce to this method at all, right? And I, I have, uh, helped more than a hundred people get published, right? But uh, more get in that process, I have also seen that more than five hundred to six hundred articles have got rejected. So there's no secret sauce to any of this. So the best way that I do go about doing these things is to identify beats. Every publication has specific people that have beats. Beat is nothing but a very specific focus area for a journalist, right? For instance, somebody would have politics beat, somebody would have sports beat, somebody would have some other beat. Identify the people in these publications that have specific beats. How do you identify? You read the publication a lot, you'll get a fair idea of who's publishing most in which area. If a specific staff writer is publishing something in the same focus area a lot, it is likely their beat. Pitch your articles to these people as opposed to pitching to the contact at something something publication.com. 
right? You're more likely to get noticed. You're more likely to get published in these places. The next bit of it is that do not send your entire article to them. Don't do that, right? Uh, nobody's going to read that. Nobody has time. Uh, journalistic Journalists get somewhere around 30 to 50 pitches per day, right? And it is those pitches that get acknowledged and not the entire articles. So how to write a pitch is something that you get to practice, right? But you always need to have a just three or four line pitch for your entire article. The pitch should cover key question, your answer, and what it means to the rest of the world. I'll repeat, key question, your answer, what it means to the rest of the world. This is basically what your pitch should cover. And the moment you write a pitch, you can write a pitch and attach your article, that is okay, because if sometimes if people are interested, they might read it. But never do things like, hey, I have written an article, would you like to get published? Please find that as the same. Nobody's going to read that. I can assure you that. Right? That's basically how you do that. Uh, there are specific times of the day that you can do. Usually, um, afternoon is when beats get closed. Right? I mean, they finalize the list of, if you're submitting to a print publication, 12 p.m. is usually like a deadline. And if you submit your things before that, you're going to you're, have a higher chance of getting noticed as opposed to before then. If you submit sometime in the evening, nobody is going to read it. It is very unlikely that people are going to just... Um, it's unlikely that people will even open your email. So just ensure that you time most of it to the mornings. So yeah, those are the bit about that. Don't be scared of rejections. You get rejected all the time. Uh, my first article appeared in 2014, right? That is when my first article appeared. I had been rejected around 24 times before that. So that is going to happen. Rejection is very, very common. Don't be disheartened. Keep submitting it. I also get this question of, oh my God, who's even going to be remotely interested in reading my article? That's not a question you should ask yourselves at all. I think everybody should write and everybody has good stories to tell. And the more you write, the better stories will emerge and it becomes much easier for the rest of the world to relate to that particular thing. If your articles do get selected then you should know that you truly truly have something unique to offer to the rest of the world and i think that i can i can given the kind of answers that i saw especially in the lead and thesis i can see a lot of good articles coming so also gonna... that is my email and in case any of you want some sort of help or suggestion to all of these things i'd be very happy to give uh, give suggestions give feedback just allow me 24 hours to <laughs> respond that would be the ideal time thanks a lot sana over to you yeah no we might have some questions also you need to update your email id to rnp yeah yeah, RNP. yeah, yeah i know <laughs> that's my personal email id i'll do that <laughs> yes so uh i know that some people have hard stop at 3 30 those it's okay. okay. If you want to stay back, maybe ask a couple of questions. I'm happy to take any of them. Yeah, so I think the offer that Ganesh uh, made in terms of if there is assistance that you need at any point in time, just to add a bit to do, do, do your research on who publishes it. If you do have a journalist list, it's easier then to start pitching to them um, and starting a relationship with them and then kind of seeing where that goes, not over intrusively, but kind of having some sort of an engagement. Yeah, if there are any questions in the interest of time, you could, if you can stay on, that's cool. Otherwise, you could also email Ganesh as well. Yeah, I think you did a great job, Ganesh. Either oh, or either, like... either I did a great job or I did such a terrible job that they didn't have... <laughs> they're like, oh my God, please let this end and all of that. Yeah. Great. Um, so
thank you thank you all for joining uh, i think meera had a question of yeah she had recently... yeah i can forward some examples later no worries yeah you can just email me i'll forward you some examples yeah Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Thank you.